In the first half of the 20th century, smoking was perceived as a signal of cool status. Some health professionals at the time even argued that cigarettes have health benefits. However, once we applied the methods of science to test the relationship between smoking and medical complications, the evidence was clear. Smoking has a direct causal relationship with a multitude of cancers and cardiovascular problems. We were ignorant to those problems and who knows how many lives were lost as a result. There is yet another cultural norm with serious negative health implications, which is much more widespread and has also been largely ignored, and that's sitting. It's something that seems harmless, and everyone does it to some degree, but we now have evidence showing that it can be detrimental to one's health, especially over prolonged periods. So much of what we do today is done in a seated position. Eating, driving, working, and watching TV are just some of the activities that people engage in while seated. When added together, these can amount to large portions of our waking life. This is quite concerning considering that sitting for each of these, as well as total sit time, is an independent risk factor for type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Both of those morbidities can reduce our overall quality of life and result in a large economic burden associated with medical treatments. But sitting can also increase your risk of an early death. A study out of Australia showed that prolonged sitting, especially for eight or more hours per day, increases your risk of all-cause mortality, even independent of your physical activity levels. This has been further supported by a more recent study showing that physically active people aren't immune to the acute effects of prolonged sitting. They still show changes in blood pressure and increased arterial stiffness after two hours of sitting. Researchers believe that many of these blood flow issues that arise from prolonged sitting are due to that 90 degree bend in the hips and knees. A team out of the University of Nebraska at Omaha said, we can infer that the prolonged leg arterial bending that is associated with the seated position can impair hemodynamics, which may be a factor in producing a potential transient proatherogenic environment. Following up with, we hypothesized that the bent artery morphology associated with the seated position is a major initiator of sitting-induced changes in vascular function. Aside from the vascular issues, the bent posture of sitting is also linked to chronic pain. One study looking at three different sitting positions showed that a forward-leaning sitting posture is especially prone to triggering lower back pain. A paper published in American Family Physician notes how prolonged sitting and rising from a seat can aggravate hip pain, especially for those suffering from hip impingement. We are not adapted to these positions, sitting at right angles. In fact, humans are specifically adapted to standing upright. This is partly why sitting is so incongruent with our health. Our bodies are not designed to sit for long periods of interrupted time. Humans evolved very specific adaptations to support our vertical posture which helped us walk bipedally and eventually run for long stretches of time. The earliest evidence of this comes from fossils in Chad, suggesting that proto-humans were transitioning from arboreal to land living 7 million years ago. Then, by maybe 4 million years ago, and definitely by 2 million years ago, humans were vertically oriented bipeds. Species like Homo habilis and Homo erectus we're navigating the savannas of Africa and exploring new lands in Eurasia with an upright posture. There were many adaptations needed to make this full transition, but four in particular were very important. Let's start from the bottom up. First, our feet are shorter and have a more distinct arch than the feet of our ape relatives. These shorter, stiff arched feet are more energetically efficient for walking and running on two feet, acting like springs propelling us forward. Second, our hip and waist morphology is unique. Our waists are taller and narrower than chimps. The large broad bone that forms the upper part of the pelvis, the ilium, is tall and faces backwards in apes. But this part of the hip is short and faces sideways in humans. This sideways orientation is a crucial adaptation for bipedalism. 
because it allows the muscles on the side of the hips to stabilize the upper body over each leg during walking when only one leg is on the ground. And this is by paleoanthropologist Daniel Lieberman. Third, we have an S-shaped spine. The C-shaped spine of other apes places their upper torso slightly forward in front of their hips. Because we have two curves in ours, the lumbar and thoracic, our upper bodies sit directly atop our hips. This makes for a more stable upright posture. Fourth, the connection between that S-shaped spine and our skulls is unique. Known as the foramen magnum, this part of the skull is the entrance for the spinal cord, allowing it to connect to the brain. In many primates, the foramen magnum is set towards the back of the skull. This makes sense if you're walking or climbing on all fours because it allows you to look forward. However, if you stand on two feet, you want that foramen magnum to be on the bottom of your skull to look in front of you, or else you'd constantly be looking down. Note how two of the locales for chronic pain due to sitting are exactly where our bodies have adapted to bipedality, the hips and the lower back. So these are the anatomical adaptations that suggest we should be spending more time in a standing upright posture. But what about behavioral evidence? In the West, we sit in weird ways. But don't modern hunter-gatherers sit? And haven't they always? You may think that if the answer is yes, which it is, then that suggests sitting is something we should be better adapted to. But it is a little more nuanced than that. First, hunter-gatherers don't sit in industrially created chairs that put us in that typical right angle position. This means that they are more likely to spend time kneeling, sitting on the ground, or in a full squat. Second, they don't stay seated as long as us. People in the West often sit for 40 plus minutes at a time, whereas hunter-gatherers stand up and move around every 10 or 15 minutes. This will be a key point when discussing how to combat the negative effects of sitting later in this video. Just for perspective, let's take a look at physical activity from a broader standpoint. Researchers have recently looked into the evolution of steps, how many are taken in a day by different primate species. Roughly speaking, as you progress through species that are more closely related to humans, you see an increased amount of steps taken per day. Hunter-gatherers take the most, ranging from 10 to 18,000. However, people in industrialized societies have step counts that fall back closer to those of chimps and bonobos, sometimes as low as 5,000 steps per day. The researchers also showed how this more ape-like walking habit associated with modern culture is linked to greater risks of cardiovascular problems compared to people living in hunter-gatherer communities. Presumably, as our species shifted from its more traditional life ways, much of our physical activity time was replaced with sitting. As of 2008, Americans spent up to 7.7 .7 hours per day seated, and oftentimes more. This number has likely only gone up since the rise of social media use during our leisure time. The solutions to this problem are numerous, and some are quite creative. First and foremost, simply don't sit continuously for long periods of time. Of course, many people work at a desk for up to 8 or 9 hours per day, but I doubt your office has rules against briefly standing up or going to the bathroom. Multiple studies have shown that breaking up bouts of sitting with standing breaks or light walks can significantly improve various cardiometabolic health markers related to glucose, insulin, and triglyceride levels. Second, Consider swapping your old work desk for a standing desk. It's been shown that there is a significant increase in caloric expenditure in subjects that were standing at a standing classroom desk compared with sitting at a standard classroom desk. One study even found that employees who use standing desks are more productive. If you find that most of your work from home day is spent seated, it might be time to consider changing up your workspace. Lastly, we can look to fix the sitting problem from an organizational level. Schools and businesses should consider reorganizing their work environments to accommodate these concerns. One study looked at active workstations for both adults and children. This included the standing desks 
discussed previously, as well as treadmill and cycling desks. They found decreased sitting time, increased energy expenditure, a positive effect on several health markers, and no detrimental effect on work performance associated with these active workstations. A more artistic approach to this has been termed the end of sitting, which is an architectural style of designing workspaces to allow people to work in all sorts of positions. There are no chairs or tables, only surfaces of various angles. It's like an office jungle gym of productivity. A 2015 study looking into the influence of this type of design on human behavior found that 83% of participants worked in different non-sitting postures at different locations, giving rise to locomotion. A final important tip is to reduce the amount of time spent sitting outside of work during your leisure time. Make sure you're staying physically active and try to make up for those steps we're no longer taking. Rucking can be a great way to do this by adding a little more resistance than normal walking. And you can watch my video on rucking here.